I wonder, is that a challenge for you? Is that, or do you see that a challenge for a lot of people around you? Like, to stay disciplined when you could make every excuse to just chill? A thousand percent. Of course it's a challenge. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm highly disciplined and it's a challenge for me. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'd be a, a tremendous. I think that is the challenge. That's the challenge with everything. It's, it's, you set a goal, you know, whatever the goal is. You see with our clients, you know, uh, I want to lose ten kilos, and they lose two or they lose three, and they, they, they say, oh, you know, I've lost three kilos. Yay! They celebrate, um, but they don't get to ten. I, I think, you know, to explain this in a different way, explain it in the financial world, um, the propensity to build wealth creates an inertia to build more wealth. Hmm. So what that basically means is that if you have $10, the value of the dollar is 10% of your wealth. If you have $100, the value of a dollar is 1% of your wealth. Now, obviously, if you have a million dollars, a hundred million dollars, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the more money you have, the less value a dollar is. So this also often happens with our goals. So the closer and the more success someone has, I, I think, quite honestly, unless your goal is big enough, um, the more of an, an inertia that someone builds towards their goal. I mean, if you squat 200 kilos, let's say, for example, you're pretty strong. You're pretty good. That's, that's pretty good, right? Mm. It's not 250 kilos, but you're certainly stronger than most people. Um, now, you at that might stage might say, you know, I'm, I'm the strongest guy at my local gym. Great. You know, I, I could do a local comp and actually, you know, I could win the local comp, but you're not going to win a national comp. You're not going to win an international comp at 200 kilos. So that taste of victory, that taste of success in, in builds. And I mean, this goes, this is a principle that crossovers into business, crossovers into every area of life. So yeah, hundred um, percent, it's, it's the discipline, it's the movements, it's the reps, it's getting up, it's doing the fundamentals. It's so, interesting, the, that concept, the, the inertia concept that you talk about in the, in the financial sp- space and in the business space, and then it extends to everything. <coughs> and mm. I wonder, it makes me think, well, for certain types of people, it's never enough. Like, it's not about the outcome. It is a little bit, but it's more about the process, beliefs, and like what's underneath and that process of just continual growth and development. Okay. How do you pass out the two and, and, and like think about those two, like outcome versus just, process? Just to clarify, we've, we've already started. Oh, yeah, we're in. We're good. We're, good. Uh, yeah. we're just talking. Yeah, exactly. It's so, so easy. <laughs> Um, well, I agree 100%. 100% with what you just said. It's always about the process. And um, it, it's a large part about detaching yourself from the outcome and just falling in love with what you're doing. And I think with that said, often what you're doing, there's going to be times that you absolutely love it and you're like, oh my God, this is this is amazing that I get to do this. And then other times you're going to be, I, I hate it. I absolutely, I'm, I've just had enough. I need a break. Um, I've pushed myself. So I think it's um, realizing that that's, that's kind of what's going to happen and being okay with that, that. But if the goal is worthy of you becoming a better person, then you know what, what is the ultimate outcome that you're seeking? I think money is only going to push you so far. And when you get money, you, you know, you're not going to work for money, right? You, you, there's, you're always in life. I think your voids are going to dictate your values. So whatever you think is missing, you're going to seek. And once you've fulfilled that value, mm. you know, that inertia comes in. So it either needs to be a very deep seated, you know, like I'm not good enough, uh, kind of a uh, void that you're constantly trying to fill up. But, you know, I think, I think for a large part, when you do have that success, you, you do, you do your self-esteem. I think once you have those achievements, that self-esteem cup does start to get more full. Um, so then, it, then it comes a case of, you know, what, 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 have, what, what's my purpose, right? What is my purpose? Um, what do I get enjoyment? What do I get fulfillment? What do I feel grateful for being able to do? I'm working on a book at the moment and, you know, certainly there are times and there are chapters in the book that I'm writing that aren't the most interesting, but then there are for me, but I've got to explain it. I've got to explain it. I've got to put the studies in there, the research, all that kind of stuff, because that's, that's, you know, people are going to question that. Right. Mm. Um, but at the same time, there are times when I write where it's like, I have giggles to myself because I think it's really great work. Right. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. Um, and it's balancing the two, you know, it's balancing the two, but I think if you, you got to, you got to, holds and focus and what is the process what is the outcome and i think most goals are there to make you a better person it's like that that alchemist story of the alchemist Mm. 
so many people miss the point of that story. It's like, you know, he started at one point and kind of ended up at the same point, you know, it, n- no, that not at all. Like the, the goal, he turned alchemy, the, the, what is it? Lead into gold uh, or coal, coal into diamonds, however you want to um, phrase it. The whole point of it is um, you know, his, his life, his experience, who he became was far more enriched from the goal and the challenge. And that ultimately is what we're talking about. It's not, Having the ability to turn lead into gold, it's learning how to turn lead into gold. Right. That is the process. That's that's so important. You just that's people will pick up on that. The way you just said that, and like for those who haven't read The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, Santiago's Journey, it's like that's that's very. Uh, I'm glad you cl- you brought that up because that journey, why that I think book is so popular, is because it it everybody can relate to it on a human level right and it's that journey santiago goes on he makes this metaphysical spiritual emotional mental transformation physically in the same space starts back again but inside he's transformed yeah 100 percent. i wonder for you mark because you talked about the voids I think, if I recall correctly, the voids determine the values, right? Voids, your voids in life dictate your values. Yeah. So if you grow up as, I'll give you my own example, uh, I'm the fat kid, right? So you, you are or kid, were? I, I was, I was the fat kid, right? So yeah. uh, I, I'm the fat kid at school, and then what do I, what do I seek? I seek, uh, I want to be the, the the popular kid. I want to be the good looking kid. I want to be the the kid who has muscles, mm-hmm. right? So then you go on a quest to seek that and to seek uh, how, do, how do I become more? So you fall into training. So all of a sudden now your voids have created a value on you know, physical development. And from that physical development, you now derive your judgments of how you see the world. So now you say, all right, this is good. And you label any other activity as bad. So then as a teenager, I would label things like you know, drinking, partying, all this kind of stuff is bad going to the gym, getting up early is good. And that then, you know, forms a basis for how you, I think in those formative years live your life, right? So this is where I developed my discipline from early on. So whether it's, you know, you, you are the, the dumb one at school, that you, you're the dumb one at school, you're gonna seek knowledge, that's gonna be a void. So knowledge then often. So if you look at some of the greatest people, um, whether it was, you know, Warren Buffett grew up in the, the Great Depression, uh, had, a, had a, he didn't have any money, he was, you know, he's folks didn't have any money that was a real void for him so now you know one of the wealthiest men on on the planet or um stories of people who are uneducated become unbelievably smart get triple degrees all this kind of stuff so this is when i say your voids what's missing initially in life you go out and seek Mm -hmm. and uh try and fill up that cup and then that becomes kind of part of your your quest how do you think because people would look at i think a guy like you all right, he's gone on that journey. You're still on the journey, but he's gone on a lot. He's done a lot of that hard work. He's transformed himself. He has a successful business for years and years, worked with hundreds of different people. How do you think you can, if you had a young Mark or a young coach and trainer, how do you, and they don't know their values yet and they're very insecure, and I know that ties into part of the answer, but how do you get them to, create the courage to figure out who they are to go on that journey and, and create that discipline to become that person? It's quite an interesting question. Um, to make sure I've got the question right in my head, basically what you're asking is, how do you encourage someone who's young mm-hmm. uh, to step forward on their journey? Yeah, and just... trust in the journey? F- and figure out who they are and slay their dragons. Man, that's a good question. I don't know. I think that's a probably a ten billion dollar question. Um, you know, or well, at least a four hundred million dollar because I know Anthony Robbins' business. I think is worth at least that much, um, and he that's exactly what he tries to do. So no, look, I, I think it's different for everyone. You know, I think it's different for everyone. I think um, you know some people are spiritual, some people aren't. Some people are religious, some people aren't. Some people just want to deal with the physical, and, and everyone I think is on their own journey, right? So um, you know. I, I certainly, I don't think I have the answers for all. And I think people are attracted and gravitate towards me because they see that I can help them. And usually if, if that's the, the case uh, of that, then, um, you know, it's always just assessing where, where people are at, you know, what, what are they, 
What are they looking for? What are they searching for? What, uh, you know, I suppose, what, what do they need? It's very, very hard to, to answer. Yeah. I don't even know where to begin exactly. Well, okay. I mean, it's just, it's just trust in the journey. You know, I mean, it's simple as it sounds, but. Um, well, let's yeah. strip it back then. Just building that self awareness to realize what values are important to you. How did you do it as a younger um, adult and kid? I just kept going. Yeah, I just kept trying. Um, and maybe maybe that's the answer is you will figure it out. Just there, there is something to be said about fail, failure. You know, I have failed that many times. I have wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I, have, I have had to stop businesses that were making money um, just because ultimately it, it was limiting me. It was, it was so like, so, so I suppose it's just getting up every day for me, and it was what my mum always used to say to me, was just trust in what you know today. You know, tr- trust in what you know today, and fo- follow that path of what you know today. And I do that every day. It's like, I know I want to do X, Y, and Z today. Okay, well, I'm going to write that down, and I'm going to work towards that one thing. And may- maybe you know, and this is where um, detaching yourself from. It's not necessarily always about that outcome, but as we said at the start, it's about the person you become. So if I say, let's say, for example, um, I want to own a personal training studio and every day I work towards owning a personal. And that was something I wrote down every day for, you know, since 2007, 2006, 2007, I'd write down, I want to own a personal training studio every day. Right. And I could look at that and go, right, well, you know, after three years, it's not meant to be, or, you know, the reality is after three years, I may have found something better. I may have found something that I didn't expect that was a nice surprise. Maybe I became the strength coach of Floyd Mayweather. You know, like, are you going to say no to that opportunity because you're, you're so attached to? So I, I think it's it's a little bit about that as well. It's 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 reading the play and having that goal, working as hard as you possibly can towards that initial goal, but then also um, allowing other opportunities to come in. And that's happened to me certainly a number of times where. Um, things have happened which I, I wasn't expecting and um, they've been amazing and it's really worked out to my benefit and other times it's just been about digging in my heels and, and really like looking at the universal challenges that keep happening and saying well maybe maybe this is the wrong path and um, you know m- maybe not yet uh, and answer probably the most beautiful answer I could give you is um, there's three answers to prayer yes not yet I have something better for you. I think, hmm. I think that is that that kind of sums it up. Is you, you and when I say prayer, I don't mean you know getting on your hands and knees. And if that's your thing, that's fine. But it's not my thing. I just mean prayer is in. You put something out to the universe. You put something out. You set a goal. You have an intent. You work towards it. That's what I mean by prayer. You put it and you get it. Awesome, fantastic, game over. Right, you've got it. Uh, not yet. So keep working. Right, it might take you a couple more years. Or I have something better for you, and I, I think a lot of the time is is people see that it's either yes or no, and don't really consider I have something better for you. And um, in my life, I've certainly found it's been a lot of the times I have something better for you. What you mentioned, failure, and that I think leads into some having something better for you. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent and essentially wasted, but not really wasted. But what do you think was the failure? One of your biggest failures that was your biggest blessings in disguise? Uh, when I came last at my first bodybuilding contest. You came last? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, so oh. 2004 was my very first bodybuilding contest, yeah. right? So I competed 2004 back in, you know, in Melbourne where they used to, ho- it used to be the, instead of the ICN, which you have today, it was the INBA. And it was at the Campbellwell Center, which, um, you know, like the whole story behind that. Anyway, um, I had a coach. I, I just finished high school. The coach said to me, you know, I'll train you to compete and um, <clears throat> you know, everything will be great. I'll treat you like my son, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he fed me a lot of bullshit basically, right? And um, I, I thought, I thought, you know, I, I had a chance to win. I thought, you know, definitely I'll at least come third or second, if not win. And, uh, you know, I got up and came last. And uh, I was the guy who looked, you know, who you'd look at and go, uh, he shouldn't be on stage, right? Uh, he was, I was like 68 kilos. Uh, on stage so um i was very very skinny and, and i think you know that for me again we talked about voids dictating your values that for me that experience because i worked so hard on that i was training twice a day i did everything right i you know starved myself it was like 
I really sacrificed and put everything I could. But I, fundamentally, the plan that I followed and the advice that I got was wrong. It, it was it was wrong in every single way um, in terms of the outcome that I wanted to achieve. So having that uh, then put a focus on me to say, um, I need to be the expert. I need to be the one who, because I don't want this to happen to anyone else. And I certainly don't want to go to, through this again, seeing how much effort and time and all this energy that I put in. So I'm going to be the expert. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be the guy that people come to when they want to compete and they know 100% when I tell them, do this diet, they know they're going to get the result. And now we've coached over 260 titles. I've coached some of the best comp prep coaches in the country. Um, you know, when I was at my peak of my coaching career, which was probably around 2012, 2013, 14, it was a very regular occurrence where I would have every week someone from interstate flying in uh, to do a consult with me um, for their comp. I remember one weekend I had a Miss Tasmania, uh, a Miss South, Mr. South Australia, Australia uh, win, like in the same weekend from different states. So um, if I had not had that experience, I would not have formulated and systemized what we do with comp prep. Mm. There's no doubt about it. So it's not a business failure as such. It's more of a, a training and personal failure. Uh, but that, that really was quite a deep cut and uh, instigated, you know, the next probably seven years of education. I think that was your crossroad moment, crossroads moment. And a lot of people, they have those moments. And I think they take one of those two steps. They either take the step forward into something productive, mm -hmm. the, the path of, of most resistance, essentially, or they go the other way. How, why didn't you go the other way? Because a lot of people do. What do you tell, how do you talk to those people who are just, that demotivates them so much they just give up and i didn't even consider the other option the other option wasn't a thing it mm -hmm. wasn't like it never it never came like to be honest with you, it never came into my mind like i'm gonna stop training like i think i might have thought oh i think i think it might have been like an hour or a day like i'm like oh maybe i'm not good at this and i think i even did think maybe i'm not good at this but then i i remember thinking well i can learn yeah you know, and someone bought me like the Arnold Schwarzenegger encyclopedia. I think it was my mum, or I saw it. I saw it. I got this. I'm like, I'm just going to study this. And um, that was my friend. And then, and then actually, it was one of my friends who said to me after the comp, he goes, You know, if you're next comp, you know who you should see? I go, Who? Tony Doherty. And then in 2005, the next year, I got Tony Doherty to coach me for the comp. Hmm. And that's how I met. That's the first time I met Tony Doherty. I remember calling up Doherty's gym. This was in 2005. And I go, Hey, Tony, I've heard about you. Um, I was wondering if you train me for your comp. I mean, I would have been like 20 years old, right? Um, 2021. 20, and no, I had no idea who Tony was at the time. And I came down. I was like, he goes, yeah, yeah, cool. I'll, um, I'll coach you, blah, blah, blah. And he got me ready for the comp. And, and there's a whole story behind that as well. And um, yeah, I mean, from that, then my next comp, uh, you know, there was a whole thing that happened for me. I fell into the category of I want to be a bodybuilder. I wasn't really a bodybuilder. Then I met Warren Clampett and he helped me with my next comp and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually meeting Charles Poliquin, um, which really changed things. So, Speaking of mm. the late Poliquin, I mean, we have spoken to some people before who are, were fortunate enough to learn under him. What impact did he have on you personally? What, how did he mold your values and, and coaching principles? You know, what, yeah. Charles was great. He was really great. Um, he was really great. He, he, it's like, how do you summarize that? So I think I first met Charles 2009. When I was at a gym and the gym owner said to me, you know, you should do a Poliquin course. And we started talking and I was like, yeah, awesome. I'm going to do a Poliquin course. So I found the next Poliquin course and I enrolled and I said, hey, you should do it with me. And he had no interest in doing it. It was funny. He told me to do it, but I, I found it funny at the time that he had no interest. Um, so I did the Poliquin course. And Charles, in his wisdom, he was like, you know, I think at the first biosig, I was like 16.8% body fat. And he's like, everyone, you're fat. <laughs> like, if you're not 10%, you're fat. Yeah. And um, I remember him talking about supplements. Like, you saw me, I'm like, I mean, I'll sit actually the very first Polican course I went to, I was sat next to Dane McDonald, right? And um, who's the owner of Clean How. And Charles said, oh, who has a list? Who has an email list here? And Dane and I were the only two people in the class that put our hands up and we happened to sit next to each other. And um, we looked at each other. It's like, oh, friend. Um, yeah, we became friends from that day. Like it was, 
So interesting because, you know, he's in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne and we've always kind of had a, had a good relationship in, in that regard in our personal training studios. Now he's doing the education thing. Um, but I digress. It was um, Charles, yeah, just from that, that first seminar, he called pretty much everyone fat. Everyone, everyone wasn't good enough. Um, and he wasn't scared to say it. And mm. I think like it's, it's great. Like we live in such a PC world and constantly challenges, challenged me, constantly. Like he's, I remember he said to me, I said, Charles, when am I going to get my POC level five? My client has won four Australian titles and she just won the FIDEX. Uh, was it the FIDEX? No, she won the um, IMBA Olympia, Janet Kane, for like the third time. And he goes, Mark, you train bumfuck athletes. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I'm not giving you a POC level five for training physique competitors. Train a real athlete. Like Olympic like, athletes, is that's what he's referring to? Yeah, I was like, well, fuck you, Charles. But, like, and that was, um, I suppose, you know, some people if they get challenged like that they're like oh you know i'm like fuck you charles i'll train a real athlete so like i'm like oh, i'm gonna put my feelers out for a real athlete as he called them and um you know then belinda caruzzi who uh owns a gym she was one of my clients for quite a while i trained her she won um fitness comp all sharing goals we're quite good friends we're sharing goals one day and i said i need to train a commonwealth i need to train a gold medalist i want to get my pac level five she goes oh, i know a guy i go who he's going for the commonwealth games andrew maloney right current world champion um or no sorry he just lost but he was the world champion uh i said really i go i need to meet this kid anyway he knew who i was because i previously had trained um freddie tooks who won the australian title in boxing so then i met andrew i said to andrew hey andrew um basically the way this is going to work is i'm gonna um i'm gonna train you for free you're gonna win commonwealth games gold i'm gonna get my PSC level five when we <laughs> laughed and uh, he's like, sure, let's, uh, let's, let's do it. You know, exactly that, exactly that happened. Um, I trained him, I was his strength coach, obviously not his boxing coach, because that's not what I do. I was his strength coach and for many years and uh, he won Commonwealth Games gold. I got my PSC level five. And, uh, what was that moment you went back to Charles? Was the, yeah, can you, can you tell that, that story, that moment? Well, it was a little bit annoying um, because like literally this was 2014 when he won the Glasgow Games and um, Charles had just left like the whole Poliquin group, Poliquin Institute thing mm. had just finished. So when I submitted it, it was Stefan Kozult, who's fantastic. He's the one who was actually in charge of it. But then I went back to Charles and said, hey, look, I got my PS level five. He goes, yeah, yeah awesome. So um, Charles, if you've ever sent an email or a message to, Ch uh, to Charles, he's a man of very few words. Mm. So uh, I remember he gave me a goal and this was, this was actually just before he died. He gave me a goal of hitting 300 sessions he said you know you're not a world-class gym unless you hit you know this per square meters whatever it was and he said for your gym it's 300 sessions a week and i said fuck you know at the time i was doing like busting my ass to do 220 250 was like wow and i remember the week we got it um i sent him an email i said we just did 300 sessions and he wrote back like that's really good like it was the longest response i've ever got from charles over text and um i was like yeah it's fucking awesome like so so when i went to him i wasn't expecting like him to you know give me a round of applause and say well done because i think in person he would have been a bit more and i did see i think in person and he was like no it's really good blah 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 um but you know he doesn't he, he rewards hard work but he never was too to uh i suppose uh you know blue smoke up your ass exactly like, but when, that, when that's that's good what's the next goal when he does compliment say something it means a lot right yes correct and that look that's how i've always been as well and that's why i suppose i i responded to that because you know one of the feedback i get from you know when i was again coaching clients was you know you never give me compliments <laughs> my, my answer to that was do something good and i'll give you a compliment right. i'm not gonna i'm gonna blow smoke up your ass if yeah. you do a bad rep i'm gonna tell you yeah. right um you've done bad reps today so i'm not gonna like i'm here to train you i'm not here to, to just entertain you right um, and when I give you a compliment, it's going to mean something. So I, yeah, I, I get it 100%. And I think that's why I, um, I really responded to that uh, way of, of thought and yeah, the way he was. And I didn't take it like, you know, I didn't take it negatively um, at all. I was like, you know, this, this, is, this is his standard. Uh, he's, he's got a great standard. And ultimately what I want to do is I want to, I want to, um, I want to, I want to beat that level. Mm. So how do I do it? Okay. This is, this is the level. This is the level that we're at. All right. Well, game on. Like you can, I mean, you can go, you know what? Your level is bullshit. I don't believe your level. Um, you know, I'm going to make my own level. That's bullshit. I don't want to conform to that. 
or you can say, you know, and I think with Charles, for me, it was, no, this guy has, um, he's got some good stuff to say. I, I like, I like the cut of his jib, so to speak. And, uh, you know, at, at least I, I want to get to the top of that level and develop my own. Like if I'm going to be critical of anything, then I need to be a master in his system. And then I've earned the right to be critical of everything. Like kind of thing. That's how I saw it. So I want to, I want to play the game. I want to win. Hmm. And then I get to make a rule. Because his system embodied true excellence to you. I, I really think it did. Look, no system is without faults. No system without, is without faults um, in, in that regard. I think when you systemize something. So look, there, there were things and there are things that I use and I utilize quite a bit. And I'd say there's 80%, there's 20% I disagree with. Um, and it's not massive things. It's small points, small tweaks that, that I have on things. But uh, I think it's a, it's a development of, of what, but I mean, the core fundamentals of what Poliquin put forward, I think uh, 80%, 80%, uh, if not more, of programming, um, programming and training. Like you're not going to go wrong on his system. You're just not. Uh, is it everything? No. Uh, is it, are there things that I tweak and don't like? Yes. Um, but there, there are a lot of good stuff as well. A lot of good stuff. When you had that, there's so many places we could go with with that story alone. And one of them comes to mind is when you had that potential gold medalist who turned into a gold medalist before you got your level five, how did you, how did you get him there? Because that's pressure. You need to get this guy and strength and conditioning, it's a cog in a wheel, right? He has his skills coach. He has his psycho- psychology, right? There's so many aspects. But how did you maximize that opportunity and that strength and conditioning? The strength and conditioning. Um, I'll, I'll start this by saying most people lose because they play not to win. I was playing to win. And I, 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 there was no, and there have been moments in my life where. I'm like doing something. I'm not playing to win. I'm playing just not to lose. And there's a completely different. Like with with when I met Andrew, when I met Freddie Tooks, when I met those boxers, I'm like, we're winning. I don't, I don't like we are winning, and that's the mind frame. So when Andrew would show up to training, I would treat him. I'd, I'd call him the world champion. I'd call him like you're going to win Commonwealth Games. Like this is this is happening. Um, that's how like I saw him. It's the Pygmalion effect as well like I saw him as the world champion uh, legitimately and maybe even before he saw himself I don't know um, but uh, like I, I really I really believed in him and um, I think you, you got to believe in your clients and there wasn't it there wasn't ever a doubt in my head like could could this guy do it like I'm like we're doing it and um, we're doing it so like you know just little things I, I suppose I'll, I'll often you know when you sponsor a client things can like bad habits can can happen right where you're not on time. You don't over deliver. Instead of doing, you know, the, the agreed upon three sessions a week, you start going, oh, you know, actually I've got this thing on. Um, I'm not getting paid for it anyway. Can I just move your time? It was the opposite. Like I treated him like he was paying me $500 an hour. Mm. It, it was like this, your training is more valuable than everyone else's. Like this is, oh, you need this time? Yeah, no problem. Let's make it work. Oh, we need a reschedule? Okay, what time? Okay, I'll be there. Um, so I, I suppose just showing up at that level and making sure and just like really, this was the goal and I really wanted to achieve it. I really, really wanted to achieve it and um, with him and I wanted to, to prove my own craft and my own work uh, in what I do. And I had a, had a willing student who, who wanted to go through that. So um, I don't know if that answers the question it or does. makes sense. When you say pressure, uh, I was just, I suppose, enjoying the process so much that I, I didn't have to stop and go, I have pressure. Like it was more, I'm going to do the very best that I can. And um, you know, I mean, like Jocko Willings would say, you either win or you learn. And um, I was just committed to doing the very best that I can. And I'm going to play to win. And if, you know, my strategy of strength coaching, conditioning, nutrition, the supplements or whatever it was fails, then like I have to get better. Like I'm going to have another crack. I'm going to find another athlete. Um, it, 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 it wasn't it's like this is what I want to achieve yeah. so I was very clear on that it sounds to me it's more important like you didn't mention anything about sets and reps you mentioned turning up over delivering a very high standard and belief you mentioned all these important aspects from a psychological perspective and an and a action perspective and I think that answers the question 
Yeah, completely. Well, look, I, I had total trust in the system that I was using mm. and total, total confidence in my ability. It's like, all right, you've never done it before. But at that stage, I already had trained Freddie Tooks, who won the Australian title. Yeah. And he was in better shape, you know, in his 40s than he was, you know, in, in his 30s. So people saw that. And I, I knew, and I, I, I knew it's like, for me, there wasn't a doubt in my ability. I had no doubts in my ability to be able to produce. And I, I, I personally, like, you know, boxers and athletes, they want to um, prove their ability in the ring. I wanted to prove my ability as a strength coach and coach with my athletes. And I want, I wanted him to be like, well, like I know my athletes are better than other people's athletes. If that makes sense mm. as you could call it arrogant, whatever it is. But I, I like, I, I want I want to test that. I want to have an athlete. I want to get them in the best shape possible. And I want to test that athlete against other athletes. And I want to know is my system better than yours? Like, is my athlete more, more weight? And if your athlete kicks my athlete's ass, well, guess what? I'm Good. gonna try harder. Yeah, exactly. And um, that, that's what competition is. So, you know, um, that's how I approached it. You talk about systems and the thing is, is like, look, Orphic, what we deliver, we train personal trainers, like set threes and fours. So we have to give them a system, right? And I think, especially with programming and all these different aspects of coaching, there's a lot of systems, right? And one could argue they should be rooted in principles. But how do you, how did you figure out what your system was and how would you describe it? Like your most effect, like the principles of your enterprise fitness coaching systems that you would impart onto others, young coaches especially. Well, I agree with the premise of what you just said. It's 100%. Um... It, it needs to be rooted in principles, mm-hmm. 100%. That, that's a very good way. Systems need to be rooted in principles. So h- how do I impart it? I mean, it's all it's all evidence-based, right? It's all like, this is what's worked. Um, but you, you're breaking down training, the session itself, the motivational aspects of it, nutrition, supplementation aspects of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, is, is, there a specific, is there a specific thing you, you, you're asking? Because, I mean, there are so many... Uh, parts mm. to, to the what we do at enterprise and I've, I've borrowed from so many different people but to give you kind of a, a real easy snapshot of it yeah. is teach people how to move teach people how to lift then train them hard and in that order so if someone can't move properly well that's checkbox number one right we're not going to train someone super hard uh, if they can't move properly, because that's and if they don't know how to lift, they don't know the movement. We can't train them hard because there's going to be te- there's going to be technical failure, or there's going to be failure not because even uh, they're getting tired or fatigued. It's just they don't understand the lift. So there's a skill acquisition phase. Uh, there's a mobility phase that they they have fundamental check boxes for your clients. That you know it always goes in a, in a um, frame of mobility, stability, strength. So we've got to get people mobile. We've got to get to teach people how to stabilize properly then we're able to get people strong, at which point most people are coming to us for a physique transformation of some sort, whether it's weight loss, muscle increase. So you might be saying, you know, what's the point of mobility, stability, or even strength? But the fundamental thing is, if I can, if I can improve someone's mobility, stability, and get them stronger, they're gonna get, they're gonna, tr- they're gonna be able to do things in the gym, which they previously weren't able to do. So let's say a full squat, for example. So they're gonna be able to train harder. Their body's gonna feel better. And at the same time, I'm working with them on their nutrition anyway. And the nutrition is chipping away at those, those, uh, that fat. So at the end of say 12 weeks, I've got this result where the person now is pain-free, they've got no injuries, they know how to lift, they know how to move. Now in you know, the next phase, however long that takes, now I'm actually able to do something substantial. And instead of them squatting, you know, that 40 kilos that they've been squatting and plateauing on for, you know, the last 12, 24, even 12 months, uh, they're actually squatting substantial weights. And you can see if they follow the process, they're going to improve because the roadblocks and ceiling, so to speak, of, of, you know, you can train hard. I mean, you know, if I said to you, um, do the prowler and every workout was a prowler workout, which is what a lot of trainers do, ropes and prowler. It's busy work. It's not going to make you any better. It's just going to get your heart rate up. You're going to get a conditioning better thing, uh, benefit from that. But the thing with conditioning, we know that conditioning is, is the easiest thing to gain and it's the first thing that's lost. So w- why, if I've got a client, why do I want to focus at the t- start of their training? Why do I want to get them more conditioned? It's not going to make them better long term. 
So I look at people, I, I honestly, when I get a client in an enterprise, I train my guys the same way. It's like, you've got this client for 12 months, even though like they might sign up, sign up for three months, still you got to think about it and have the intention that you've got them for 12 months plan. Don't be in a rush. You obviously want to get them results and you will changing their diets can help them with the body fat, but you, you got to have those check boxes. You know, you got to earn the right to put a bar on your back. Mm -hmm. um, if you make a mistake, no, you don't get to put a bar. It's wrong. And you know, the guys will tell you, um, again, when I was doing a lot of coaching, a lot of my work, like when I was working with clients, you'd hear a lot of no, wrong, no, no, do it again. No, doesn't count, doesn't count, doesn't count, doesn't count, doesn't count. I would spend a whole hour just doing one exercise sometimes or two exercises because I, I wanted not just, all right, here's the program. It's like, I can't give you the whole program. I, I, you need to learn how to the movement. Once you've got the move, and sometimes it takes a lot of shots at that, like thousands of reps to learn it because I train people that when they get under that heavy load, like let's say it's a barbell squat, you are going to sink to your level of training. Mm -hmm. So if you make mistakes with a 20 kilo bar, you are going to make mistakes with 100 kilos. You're going to. So I need to make sure that the way you do the bar, 40 kilos, 60 kilos, 80 kilos, 100 kilos, 120, whatever it is, is always the same. And if you deviate from that, we have a problem. And it's my job to tell you that you deviated. And again my health of my client especially like saying andrew maloney or janet kane or these you know really uh top end athletes um the number one rule is don't ever injure them you know don't can't injure your client Do so i suppose from that that miss that uh fundamentals is i was always quite um cautious but like i wanted to leave a little bit left in the tank i know you could probably do 160 kilos but guess what we're doing 155 today i can do more i know you can i know you can but you don't need to today. Mm. Next week, we will do that. You know? Yeah. That's often the role of the coach to order, to regulate the stress and to, to reel people back in who will always want to do more. Like, you know, you can't, I mean, make, it's not practical or sustainable for everybody to Jocko Willink and David Goggins their whole life. Right? Yeah. And... I think, well, there's a price with the Jocko Willinks and David Goggins, yeah. right? There's there's a there's a fundamental price. I mean, they're Navy SEALs for a reason. What is it? You get drowned twice and resuscitated back to life. Not not everyone is what is 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 that way. But you know, you bring up a good point because this is exactly what I say to people: is there is a big difference between training and performing. So the Jocko Willinks kind of approach, um, and I think reading what I've seen of Jocko, I don't actually think he goes balls to the walls every single no, day. Okay, he doesn't no, he doesn't. Ask. He clarifies so that. Yeah, he absolutely it's, doesn't. It's, it's, it's more about, um, like, I don't care about how you feel after a workout. I care at the end of 12 weeks that we've improved. That's all I care about. So whether you feel smashed or feel like that was, that was easy, I don't really care because your feelings are going to lie to you. Some days they're going to tell you you're tired and you shouldn't train. Well, you got to understand, like you probably should get your ass to the gym some of those days, right? It's not um, like obviously if your completely nervous system is completely fried, then you know different story. But mm -hmm. if you're just unmotivated, get mm -hmm. your ass to the gym, mm -hmm. right? Um, so your feelings are, are going to lie to you both ways. Uh, so it's not about like having to do a ball stall. It's this week undershooting, this week achieving, the next week we we go for that moonshot, the fourth week we deload, and then repeat cycle and at, at that point we'll probably change a different program i mean i'll give a general overview um obviously with gen pop athletes it can be different because their level of, of strength and skill acquisition just isn't there so then when we talk about these principles of you know uh, underachieve achieve overachieve deload they're not actually relevant to a huge uh, portion of the people that most trainers see because most most of the population their first phase is learn how to move mm -hmm. and then the next phase is learn the lifts and the next phase is, okay, now we can train hard. And it's taken us 12 weeks or eight weeks rather to get to that point where you know, I can actually load you decently with a squat bar and not fear that you're going to do something wrong. Yeah. You got to earn a deload, right? It's like... Yeah, 100%. It's strange where a lot of, I see coaches that will indiscriminately program deloads in um, forever. Just, and it's, mm. it seems inefficient in a... It depends on the client. I mean, if a client's training twice a week, right, then there's no point to deload. Right. You know, but if your client's a beast and they're, they're, you know, training five days a week and they, you know, do yoga on the weekends and saunas and infrared and burn the candles, but you know, that person probably does need a deload. 
right? So it's always about, I think, you know, that's the fundamental, that's the art of coaching, yes. it's reading the play. Well said. You know, it's not just the science. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Um, I mean, I, we talked about nutrition before, and I think it is a, it's a rabbit hole. Um, it's something yeah. where people, they get their emotion um, all tied into it, their identity it's tied into their diet protocols, and they get away from the principal science, chemistry of food science. Um, how do you... And even it's such an overwhelming even thing to just pass out and ask a specific question. But when do you think is... How do as a coach know when is the right time that they should be executing nutrition programs for their clients? What's the base foundation knowledge that should be the prerequisite in your mind? Good question. Um, nutrition is often overcomplicated and people think that to, to enter even into the ball game, they need a PhD in something. Right. Uh, I disagree. You know, what gets managed gets measured. What gets measured gets managed, yeah. right? So if you wanted to do nothing else, and let's say you had a very base level of nutrition, you simply just said to your client, hey, what I need you to do just to create, and I don't, it's not about judgment. Some people might agree, disagree with this, but that's okay. I've probably got more results than they do, the ones that disagree. Um, all I need you to do for the next three days, just to build some consciousness around what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve, is I need you to just keep a, a, a reflection journal, a self-reflection log. And that self-reflection log, what I need you to include, and this is, is, is an is a exercise, not just about diet, but an exercise in understanding yourself and how you operate and to... Uh, effectively manage your life because I believe you're coming to see me not just for physical transformation but for mental and emotional transformation as well and to do that we need to have a good starting place without judgment I don't care what you're doing but I want you to self-reflect and the best way to self-reflect is to write it down so you can do it on Excel you can do it on notes on your phone or you can like I like to do with the clients what I recommend is getting yourself a little journal and carrying it with you wherever you go and what you're going to do you're going to write I woke up at six o'clock right and um, maybe a note next to it. I felt like shit. Okay, just don't judge it. Just write it down. Um, I had uh, bacon and eggs for the morning. I had six coffees by the time of 10. What it, whatever it is, you write down your day. What time you ate, when you ate, how you felt. If you were constipated, um, you know, if you went to the toilet, fine. And when you go to bed. Because that way, and this is the thing, like when you can get someone to do that and they get buy-in and they're like, you know what, I'll do this exercise. There's some people do the chicken soup diet for, for two weeks to lose, you know, 10 kilos. So the ask of someone to do a self-reflection log, I think is very small. I don't think it's uh, a stupid fat or anything. like. It's just, I need you to reflect to understand yourself is the way I phrase it. More about themselves than it is about diet. If you get someone to do that, they will come to you with the changes they need to make. Right? They will say to you, I realize why I'm fat or I realize why I'm overweight. I eat shit. I didn't realize how much shit I eat you know, I need to get to bed on time. And the, the beauty about that is you actually don't need to have any of the answers. You can just simply get someone to coach someone through keeping a self-reflection log. It's objective. You've put it down on a piece of paper. You can say to the client, hmm, where do you think we should start? You'll be amazed. Your clients will tell you, uh, well, I think I should stop having so much soft drink or I really probably should get to bed earlier. Mm. Probably not a good idea that I'm having wine and crackers all the time while I watch Netflix. I probably could do something better than just watching Netflix. Yeah, I felt really emotional. I, I don't know what to do when I get emotional. I always look at food as my crutch. So what it is, it's a conversation piece. Um, okay, well, you, again, you don't have to actually have, I mean, it helps if you have the answers and you have solutions and you have strategies, that all helps. But simply the act of getting someone to reflect on that. So that, that's one side of it. The other side of it is if someone does have a misguided view on nutrition, then they're going to be allocating the incorrect advice. So they might say, oh, you know, um, it's just about calories in versus calories out. Let's, you know, it's fine that you had McDonald's. Um, just don't have the rest of these meals. Let's be hungry for the rest of the day and just have that McDonald's meal, which I think is very short-sighted or... They're like, let's just go with a vegan approach. So it, 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 it is context versus content. Um, and it, it's very hard to divorce. It, well, you can't, I don't believe in nutrition. You can divorce those two things. And I think that's why, that's why um, 
there is so much misunderstanding because the truth of the matter is that most, the, the average person is actually below average, right? Most people are below average and they, they don't think logical, laterally, and our, our prem, I know, are you in Victoria at the moment? Yeah, Melbourne. Yeah, our, our premier, Daniel Andrews, dictator Dan, uh, keeps <laughs> saying common sense. Well, Dan, you can't say that to, the, to 6 million people because the truth is common sense isn't so common, mm-hmm. right? Um, so the thing that we, you got to establish with a lot of this stuff is that it is context and content. So I can say to you, for example, um, look, we're going to use a macro approach. It might be the right context for you and you, you can do that, right? And I can say, these are your foods. Let's do that. But if I say, let's do a macro approach to someone who's never done nutrition before, they're like m- macro. Okay. So you're saying I can eat whatever I want. It's, it's the wrong, it's, it's, for you, it's the right content. For someone else in a different context is completely wrong. So you're constantly dealing with those two variables, context and content. And that's why, like, quite honestly, I, I, it's, it's very hard for the same advice to be given. It's, it's not. It's not given. You, you, there needs to be an art of coaching. And those two variables always have to be considered. There are times where I use a food approach. There are times where I use a macro approach. There are times where you think, is this advice coming from the same guy? Like, I just heard him say the opposite thing to someone else. Well, it's... It's understanding your client and it works because you're working with that person's model of the world and that's what i think is the most important thing is you need to come up with a plan that's going to work and that person can see working and, and complements their lifestyle rather than um unhinges them as a, as a person it comes back to what you said before about their identity it is it is, it is interwoven it mm-hmm. is um but i think if you can teach people to be healthy and to have the identity of I am a healthy person who eats healthy foods that build and nourish my body. That is the identity because food is part of some of that. And that is the identity that I start with. I say from this place, how do we make food decisions? So when they've done the log, okay, if you were the healthiest version of yourself, what would you do? Yes. Sometimes they get the answer wrong. Sometimes they say something like, oh, well, I'll have um, orange juice in the morning. It's like, oh, it's still not the best choice because it's quite high in sugar and you know, you're quite insulin um, resistant. We need to probably cut back on the on the on the juice as well for the time being. Once we get you lean, then we can probably reintroduce that once you've lost some weight and we manage the other factors. So sometimes you got to reel it back, but for the most part, people will make better choices, and from contrast, they will get a result. That I think is very practical. That self reflection, I was just taking some notes on it because um, I do something. I've started doing something a bit similar, even a gratitude journal, just to get people anchoring their day with with uh, positive emotions right at the start to build out routines. However, is that something you make mandatory with all your clients? How do you hold them accountable to that? Because I, I notice some people, you'll suggest things, you recommend things, and unless you have something to hold them accountable, they just won't do it. There'll be resistance. How do you get through that resistance? Yeah, so for me, um, well, two things. Number one, charge well for your time. If you charge enough people, do what you say because they honor, honor it because it's pain. Uh, number two, it's, it's calling it out. So, hey, what I need you to do. Like, I always start with, it's also how you phrase it. Hey, um, you know, uh, can you do me a favor? What's that? All right. For, and it's a small ask initially. I might even, if I, if I sense any resistance, it might be for the next day, can you keep me a log? So, I ask them for 24 hours. Yeah. Right. Um, they do it. Hey, do you reckon you could do it again tomorrow? Yeah, all right. Do you reckon you could do it for two more days? And then like slowly I, I get a week out of them but because I, I put it like a compliancy trail. Um, very seldomly will I ever say to someone, can you give me seven days? Seven days seems overwhelming. So I'll start either 24 to, to three days depending on the client. If I say to three days and the client doesn't do it, I say, look, can you just do it for a day? Can you do it for a day? I really need it. Can, can you do it? Like I really need it. And that's the thing about the favor principle is that people are more likely to do it if it's a favor to you. So I, I use that in my, like when I'm coaching, I use it all the time. I ask people for favors all the time, even though like, like really, is it really a favor? It's just to part me? of the coaching service. No, yeah. I'm just psychological warfare, right? <laughs> um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to create the inception for you to help you achieve your goals because that's why you're paying for me. And if you think it's your idea, awesome. Like I don't really care because you're paying me to get the best out of you. So like, it, it doesn't matter. So yeah, I, uh, I just use those kind of motivational interviewing type of questions. And um, sometimes, you know, if someone really just doesn't, I remember I had one client, 
just didn't do anything that I said. Yeah. And I never, I never, I never made her wrong. I never judged her. I never said anything bad. And she just came in one day. She goes, "Hey, um, I realized that I should have listened to you a lot earlier." I was like, "Why is that?" Oh well, I did what you told me to do, and I lost two kilos in a week. It's like, wow. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. Like, I'm glad. But that you know, the amount of stories that I have like that where. I will say the same thing to clients and then, you know, third week, fourth week, fifth week, they're like, they start doing it. Um, it's just, just continue the same message or I call them out and I say, look, you know, you've paid me a lot of money to be here. Um, I just want to understand like, what's your level of input? Like, what is your resistance to challenge here? Why can't you do this? For us to move forward. So it's also selling them on what, like, what is the resistance? Selling them on the, like, why I need it, why it's important, because when people understand why it's important, they're more more likely to do it. And just confronting, like, look, I need this done. You haven't done it. Um, I don't really feel like I can, I can't manage you. I can't give you the service and the experience that you paid for if you don't do this. Um, so I really need it. it. What's the resistance to it? And then understanding, like, you know, I think it's spiritual bullshit, someone might say. You know, I don't, I don't, okay, it's spiritual bullshit. Um, do you want me to just write out your macros for you to follow it? Do you just want a logical plan? Yeah, I do. Okay, great. I'll, I'll do that. Right. You got it. Sometimes it's about like stepping into that person's model of the world. And like as a coach, you, you've got to be the chameleon. You, you, not everyone's going to see the, the world the same way as you. You've got to go into their model of the world and help them see what they're not seeing and um, work with them to help them get a result that they're paying you for. So not being attached that. Like it's personal on you. They don't believe the same as you. That's fine. They don't have to believe the same. I, if I can, I can still find something in their reality that I can work to get the result that I'm after. If that makes sense. Okay. When you have, think about like, do you not even have many of those clients now because your standards are like, you, you vet them out. Like the clients who mainly come to you are bought in 100%, all systems go or... Or is that still a problem? Well, it's, it, I, should, I should know. I stopped coaching altogether in 2018. So I don't have any personal co- uh, clients except for my Wolfpack members who are in my uh, personal training mentoring program. Um, but we, we obviously have a lot of clients at Enterprise Fitness. So by and large, the clients at Enterprise Fitness, um, people are people, but by and large, our clients are much higher quality. And um, you know they, they, they're there to get a result. They're there to do something, right? So there is a vetting process and we really try and we always do our best. But there are people sometimes, like we had one a couple of years back now who the mere mention of anything around mindset, esoterical, like I think the, the, when I say mere mention, I think the trainer asked him to, um, like he was really struggling with his food and he said, you know, you got to think something about like, think like a healthier person. And the client was like, no, that's bullshit. I don't believe in that. And I was like, all right, you got to do a different approach. I right, coach the trainer on it. It's like, you just got to give him the numbers. You just got to give him like, this is how you got to eat. You just got to give him, it's all going to be, uh, you know, quite logical because that's how he sees the world. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or what you're No, asking. it's just an example of just adapting to meet the client where they are and maybe not always trying to change them because that change is a, is a long process. And, um, you know, even though they hired you, they paid you money, it's, you still have to meet them where they are. It was the art of compliancy, right? I mean, there, there are a large portion of clients who are going to come to you and they will do what you say, but it's also how you show up, how you instruct. Um, you know, I, I, I really am quite onto my trainers. If I hear the word try in my gym or if I hear the word try by a client, I'm mm-hmm. like, no, the, that means 50%. I need you to do it. Yeah. Or, or uh, probably, I don't like these little words where people are- On the fence. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Can you do that? Or could you do like, you can ask like a favor, but if you are giving instruction, the instruction needs to be clear. So the client, like, oh, you know, if I say to you, uh, you need to eat um, 100 to 150 grams of chicken. Well, is it 100 or is it 150? It's quite um, ambiguous. You might give that as a range, but 
you, you, for a new client, it, it probably needs to be like, I, you can eat 100 to 110 grams, for example, 10% range. You're like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. I can eat this to this. Um, you know, this is how to do it. So yeah, you just got to understanding. I find if clients understand it, if they can do it, if they can see it, you have more uh, stack the deck in your favor for them to doing it. Mm. That's- and also it comes back to seeing where they're at. You know, what, what, and one of the things, first things that we do at Enterprise is out of one to 10, what is your level of commitment? Please circle it. You tell me. If you're a 10, I'll, I'll give it to you straight. I'll give it to you bluntly. You wouldn't be here if you're anything below five, but let's say you're a six or an eight. Look, we'll get results, but we won't get the results that you're probably expecting. Um, but we'll work with you, right? For you, okay, well, and the first question is what, why are you a seven? Why? why what's going to make you? And usually it's just confidence. I don't, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Okay, well, if I give you all those things, would you be a 10? Yes, I would. Okay, great. So you can follow my plan. Yes. It's pre-framing the client experience. That, that's where the artistry comes in is you pre-frame the way things are going to happen and then it happens the way you said it's going to happen and the client's like, wow, this person really knows what they're doing and um, it builds trust. And from that trust, you say, I need you to do this. They're like, yeah, cool. I'll do it straight away. What is that pre-framing process? You, you said compliance. And can you break that down? Uh, yeah, I've got a whole presentation on this actually um, that I teach inside my Wolfpack program. On, I call it the art of compliance. And there's another one that I'll go understanding client. But um, I mean, look, it starts from oh, there's so many elements to it. So many elements to it. Yeah. Um, it starts from the minute you meet the client like asking their goals, linking their goals back to your service. So, you know, if you say you want to lose weight, all right, um, this is what I need you to do. I need you to keep a diet log. I need you to keep a self-reflection log. I need you to show up on time. I need you to come in early. If you have any questions, I need you to email me as soon as you have them. Um, like just it's it's these these things, um, you know, I, and it, like I'll, I when I was coaching, I'll go as far to say, look, um, some people might think of me as rude because I don't really talk during much in the session unless it's about training. But I just want to let you know, like I'm gonna, I'm honor the fact that you pay me money, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a stopwatch. If you talk to me during your like your rest time, it's fine. But once it's time to do your set, I'm gonna tell you to shut up. I, I preframe that. Yeah. So they're like, so in the middle of a set, like if it's two minutes, and I'm like, all right, go. They're like, I was just talking to you. They're yeah. not like, oh, yeah. that was rude. I'm, I've explained it. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut you up at this because this is what you're paying me for. And I honor that. And I've, I've become like some of my clients you know, became very, very close friends. And um, like for one of them particularly, I would allocate like obviously a train for an hour, but I'd actually allocate 90 minutes because I realized the first half an hour would just be us talking. And I didn't want to charge him for that because I would get as much out of us talking as he would, right? So I would actually allocate always 90 minutes. We would kind of talk for half an hour. Then I, and then I would say to him before we started training, I'd say, okay, we're starting training. You can't, I'm going to shut you. I'm going to shut you up. And he'd be like, okay. And, and that's why like, as a friend, he continued to pay me because um, my rate, because like I honored the fact that you are paying me for a service. I'm not, I'm not taking that. I'm, you're not here to talk to me. You're here for a service and I'm going to honor that above all else. Um, so I, I need, I need to reserve the ability. So when I say expectations, it's just simple little things like this. This is what's going to happen. Um, even to the point, oh, just give me one sec. No problem. You just got to deliver it. I'm good. And I'll keep talking while, he, while Max just steps out. I think that's such a pre-framing. It's like explaining what the client can expect so they're not caught off guard. So what Mark's talking about is like, these clients aren't going to get caught off guard. It's like they know what to expect. Nah, nah, nah. nah. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, good. Yeah, it's such an important concept just because then they're not going to get caught off guard because you have framed what to expect and they may realize, hold on, maybe this isn't a good fit for me. And that's great because then you can, you're not working with a client who's not going to be a good fit for you. Oh, 100%. I had once had a woman on the line to me and I said to her, frankly, like, you know, this is what's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to you know, do this. She's like, you sound really intense. I'm like, I am. That's why we get results. She goes, oh, I don't want that. I'm like, well, look, Done. Um, I'm about getting results. Like, do, do you want me to, like, I'm going to hold the mirror up to, to what you need. Oh, I don't want that. I'm like, okay, this isn't a fit. This isn't a fit. It's fine. Like, it's fine. If you, if you want a trainer to pander to you and entertain you for the hour, like, we're, we're not it. Yeah. We're not it. That's fine. That's fine. We, we really are going to hold the session and your results and 
what you want to achieve in the highest regard. And um, if you're not serious about that, then it's, it's not the place for you. Absolutely. Well said. I want to be respectful of your time, Mark. Um, we're coming up on an hour here. Are you, are you okay to go a little bit over or do you need to finish oh, no. up? I'm, I'm okay to go a little bit over. I just might need to get sign off on something. So if I have to get up in, just in a sec, that's all, all. But apart from that, we're good. No problem at all. Appreciate it. Um, wanted to ask because what we're trying to do at Allfic is we're trying to create and restructure the most comprehensive Cert 3 and 4 in the country. That is our ambition, right? And when we talk to coaches and, and health professionals and businessmen and women like yourself, we try and pass out, all right, what are the biggest gaps in education that personal trainers have? What do you think those are and how can we fill them? Mm, really great question. I think, I think large in part, it's the understanding and this isn't something that i think necessarily because there is a difference between learning and education and i think the way the system is taught is people want an education rather than to learn like, and like a piece of paper you mean rather than yeah, experience they want to be able to say um like, okay so so what i just spoke to you before about context versus content right you have to think your way through that problem yeah right there isn't a one two three four step-by-step -step process that you can follow. But I think large in part, people want a one, two, three, four step process. And so I think, you know, it's, it's framing the material always that here are the principles, here are how to apply the principles. And then I think empowering people to then be able to, to um, make decisions. Right? And sometimes they're gonna get this decision wrong. Hopefully it's not gonna, you know, cost anyone you know, anything substantially, but I think that's part of the learning process. And how do, how do you, you know, this is where like people interning and seeing how other coaches do it, I think is, and not just one coach, like, cause you know, um, one, of the, one of my master trainers, uh, Marshall, I was his first coach and he, his first job with Enterprise and he learned everything from day one from me. And he just thought that's the way the industry is. And then he went out and re realized and we ran seminars and he's like, hey, are these guys trainers? I'm like, yeah. He's like, how come none of them know what the fuck they're doing? I'm like, hey, this is the industry. Go, you, you, you met me from day one and you know you thought, so I guess what I'm saying in that is it's also having the understanding of, of learning from, from multiple people. Um, just give me one sec, mate. No problem. Learning from multiple people. That's a, that's, that's, there, there's, there's point number one, the answer to that question like diversifying your streams of education and learning are like to diversifying your streams of income, which is being exposed right oh, now. Easy, for no worries. Mark's just stepping back in and signing something. I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, so diversifying that income and diversifying that, that education and learning experience is a huge lesson that we can all probably take and run with because you get trapped in a in a tunnel if you're just learning from that one person right you need to look laterally you need to step outside your field even what are the fields of psychology doing the fields of genetics doing and where were we we were on i was just talking about to the listeners um the comment you talked about learning from multiple different people as being one of the the principles and and pieces of um, yeah. education early trainers can do i think i think when when trainers are learning i think it's a good idea that um they they intern with a few different studios and gyms um, and just see what well, what's out there the good the bad the indifferent um rather than just go i'm just going to go here uh because yeah you really you really see you really see the difference in in the way people do things um when you're you're able to to look at you're able to see the good from the bad and um, those who stand out, those who are really knowledgeable, those who talk shit, um, that's, that really is, I think, what experience is, is just learning. And, um, you know, I think the truth is with, any, with anything in life, your, your education doesn't stop once you get the piece of paper or the Cert 3 and 4. That's when your education actually begins. And I think that, I, th I think that's probably like, in terms of mind frame, I, I see a lot of trainers who, who want a job and they, you know, they want that traditional employee, like someone's going to employ you, you're going to have a boss. 
But even as I say to my trainers, where I do employ all my trainers, right? I even say to them, you know, the truth is you don't have to keep me happy. You have to keep the client happy. If the client's happy, I'm happy. Yeah. So you don't have one boss, you have 30 bosses or however many clients you have, yeah. right? Th- th- that's the truth. So um, if you want one boss, go to get a nine to five desk job, um, you know, keep that corporate company. But personal training just isn't like that. So, you know, I think, I think by and large, you need to love training and you need to have a real understanding and I think love of personal interaction um, and, and just wanting to get the best out of people and, and, and have, I suppose, an affection for people um, as well as training. I think once you have those two things, that's where really you, you are going to be rise to, to the top. So is there anything that you can teach? Well, I suppose in summary, it's just letting trainers know like that's the deal. Um, if you want to be in this industry, that's the deal. You, you're not, this isn't the, this isn't the end of your education. This is the start. And, um, if, if you know, you, you're going to have how many, you know, you're going to have multiple bosses regardless, uh, and this industry, you know, there are many ways you can work, be it a fitness first, um, or a big box gym of any sort or an employee. And, and the truth is probably the most popular at this point in time is, is the big box model. Um, and look at works and people see that as a real, like a negative, that fitness first or whatever are going to be asking, you know, three, $400 a week rents. Um, and it's, and then, then it's understanding that like some people just aren't business people and you know, that's, that's quite a, a barrier to entry and they don't have the confidence to go into a, a scheme like that, even though, you know, it could work out very well from them, but it really is a, a hand up, not hand out industry. And if you come into this industry with your hand out, you will surely fail. You, you, you do, again, regardless of whether you work for someone or work for yourself, you need to be a go-getter. Um, I think the cowboys and the cowgirls of this industry are, especially after COVID-19, I think they really are going to struggle. Um, you know, and that's why there is such a loss of trainers who enter the industry in such a turnover. I, I, think, I think it's just the, the fundamental the understanding of what they're getting themselves in for and how the industry operates, I think. Um, and, and I suppose once that's clear, it's then I would say the, the curriculum around that is what um, is what needs to be implemented. That is a couple of really important points, and I think where one of one of the last things to finish off is you brought up this whole situation happening now, and I wonder what do you think that's exposing in people uh, within their character? What is it exposed within you? What have you learned about yourself, your business? I have no idea, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know about I yourself. Know. I know about myself, but what's it exposing in people? Wow. Um, I think it's exposing the worst. Yeah. I think it's exposing the worst in people with what I see. I think it's extremely divisive. I put up uh, now two posts on Facebook about my thoughts. Yeah. Um, and I think there are those who value freedom and those who value security. And all too often people exchange their freedom for security. And when we're seeing whether it's, the lockdown whether it's the masks whether it's you know people going along with things um people are giving up their freedoms and like 9 11 things never travel never went back to the way it was um i think covid's going to be and if we're not careful we're going to yeah. keep giving the government more and more rights um you know my personal belief so i think this is all overblown if you look at the rates compared to sars and mers and all these things which were h the one h1 n uh, whatever it was uh, uh swine flu um, those numbers were much more catastrophic. And one might quickly point out and say, well, um, you know, it's because we, we implemented lockdown that the numbers weren't as catastrophic. Okay, um, that's, a, that's a good premise, uh, but there, there, is a, there is a much bigger thing that's going on. And I think that is, you know, without getting too political, the, the, the trade war with China. I mm-hmm. think that is, that is something that isn't being talked about anywhere near isn't enough. Um, Victoria, the Victorian government has done a very poor job at protecting Victorians by signing off on the Belt and Road Project, um, giving China direct access to our ports, uh, which, the, by the way, the US Security and Defence Force said to us, do not sign this deal. Our, our federal government said, do not sign this deal. But our uh, Labor leader, Daniel Andrews, signed the deal. So I think, you know, there's the hotel scandal, there's all these things that have gone on. For me, that's probably the most concerning because if there is a war, the US basically said that if this compromises the US, we're on our own. Um, so, you know, if, if there is a war, we're on our own uh, due to, to trade, you know, and that's the thing that's, that, that's the fundamental thing that Australia would always find themselves with. If there's a war between China and the US, we would always find ourselves in the position of having to choose security over trade. 
And you would always think that uh, Australia would have to choose security because that is the, the common sense thing that we would choose. But Daniel Andrews' actions from, from signing on to the Belt Road project has actually chosen trade, which China can hurt us uh, with trade fundamentally. And if we don't have the protection from the US, well, we're fucked. <laughs> Um, so, so uh, the Australian federal government have spoken about uh, revoking the lease in the, Dor in the Darwin ports where China has direct access to. Um, and, you know, whether the federal government steps in in this case, I hope they do. But that's what would be. So for me, I know that's a political rant and probably not what you're expecting. No, question. that's okay. Um, but I think it's, 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 it's worthwhile getting these uh, thoughts out. Mm. Um, so there, there is concern about that. And I think that is, that is a tremendous concern. Um, around the world right now so yeah yeah no look I, I don't you probably don't know but I have my own podcast and these are the topics that we go all over the place and you know one day Mark I'd love to sit down and talk to you about all this um, in person um, if you're down for it yeah sounds great um, I'm down but yeah. look to summarize and I know it's not particularly the topic of the Orphic Education podcast but it is a slippery slope when freedoms get taken away they don't often get brought back in. And it's a conversation that I think we should have. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So yeah, um, I think for business, the road ahead uh, is everyone is gonna have to work a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah, I think the cream will rise to the top. I think personal training and gym industry will go on. But, uh, you know, people still wanna train, people still wanna look good, people still wanna, you know, uh, do all those things. And, um, you know, we're going to have to find a way as trainers, as the fitness community to, to serve people that go further than just online because I don't think we're ever going to get the same results and, and feeling and uh, benefits yeah. if we, we take that away. So, yeah, that's in summary. What, before we leave, you got to tell me, the sword behind you, what's the Lord story behind that? All right, so I went to a business <laughs> course and um, on the first day, so there was a record that it was basically a business course. You went there nine days, you're locked in the house and um, you had to make sales, right? So there was someone else uh, in the industry who went to that course and they sold a whole bunch of stuff. And um, anyway, over the, like they had five days to sell. In the first day I broke that guy's record. And um, then anyway, in the next five days I followed, I broke the record. And um, I said to the guy, it's like that 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 scene in uh, this is when I launched Wolfpack and I said to him like previously it's like that scene in Lord of the Rings where um, I forget his name Aragorn returns and gets the sword and he's the return of the king like I feel like I'm re getting my return like I feel like I'm returning yeah. and I just said this to him we had we having a conversation because it was like emotions are going through my head anyway at the end the trophy for me for winning they bought me the return of the king sword <laughs> so great. it's it's actually more than just a sword yeah it out. oh yeah more more than just a sword like more than just the return of the king sword from lord of the rings it's actually a trophy wow right? it's a trophy for making the most sales at a, at a at a business course so that's the give me i'll just put this back no problem that's a cool story yeah that's the story behind it um yeah that's the story behind it and you got all these books behind you Give give the listeners, give us one or two that you would recommend that have been kind of the most impactful. Oh, one I'm reading at the moment actually is, um, what's it called? It's a philosophy book. Um, just going to get it. Yeah, please. For those just listening, um, Mark sitting in his office, he has a sword behind him and a bunch of books and little figurines. Probably weren't expecting this so much philosophy from me today, but uh, I like uh, this is... Every time I find the meaning of my life, they change it by Daniel Klein. Um, some things I agree with that he says, some things I disagree with overtly, but it's he basically takes a bunch of quotes and um, like whether it's from Sam Harris, Marcus Aurelius, and he talks about what those quotes meant for him hmm. and um, how they were guiding lights. And, you know, he's 80 years old odd when he, he wrote the book, but he, he discusses these quotes. And um, I think there's, there's a lot of gold. There's a lot of gold in there. I, I quite like it, so... Very good. Appreciate uh, you sharing that. I've really enjoyed this conversation, Mark. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, do you have any last thoughts, comments, ask for the audience or just where people can find you? Yeah. Um, 
so uh, Instagram uh, is at Mark Atobri. Uh The Enterprise one is at Enterprise Fitness AU. Our website is Melbourne Personal Trainers. Um, I've got a podcast too, a YouTube show. Just I suppose if you want more on us, uh, go onto Google and type in Enterprise Fitness. It's It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me on. Really enjoyed it and, and look forward to some philosophical and political conversations in the future. Absolutely. We'll speak soon. Thank you so much, right, Mark. All right. See you, mate. See ya. Mark Atobre, I hope I said that right. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation. Um, that is it, webinar Wednesday 15. I'm just going to put on my screen uh, for you guys. The webinar Wednesday can be found. Our podcast can be found on all podcast platforms. Or see, all you got to do is go to YouTube, type in Orphic Education, or go to orphiceducation.com, and you'll see all our past guests. And we have updated our website so you can see past guests we have from Brett B, Brett Bartholomew, to Sean Baker, to Durham McInnes at, at uh, Core Advantage, to Christian Woodford at Woodfords, to Carl Goodman and Lockie Woolman from Athletes Authority. It's stacked. And then there's me. Who's this guy? Alexander Emmanuel. You Google me if you want to know more about me, but um, it's an absolute pleasure for me to do these. And if you guys want to find out more about them, you just go to our website and our social media um, and put your name and information in that. We'll let you know when they're out. Guys, we do these every Wednesday. Orphic Podcast. Orphic is an education company that deliver some of the most comprehensive Cert 3s and 4s in fitness in the country. And... We are really trying to take over and raise the stand of this whole whole industry by uh, by delivering what we're creating and what we've been creating. What we're already doing is is our most practical, most in depth cert three and four in the country. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Can't wait to speak to Mark Moore. And that's it. Gothic Education. I'm Alexander Emmanuel. See you guys next week. 